you don't have to come up with recommendations. A really good win-loss program will diagnose the challenges and the strong points of your business well enough that there's a whole host of people that can go figure out really intelligent solutions based on the context of what they're doing in their job function. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily need to do that for them. Just getting the findings and just diagnosing the issues will make you look like a hero. Welcome to the Win Loss Podcast for Product Marketers. I'm Trenton Romp, the head of marketing at Closed, and joining me on this podcast is Scott Knudsen, head of sales enablement at Closed. Closed, for those who don't know, is the leading provider of win loss analysis services and tech. That's right. In this podcast, Scott and I are going to talk about how product marketers can use win loss analysis to succeed at reaching their top goals and initiatives. Things like win rate, sales enablement, and product roadmaps. Also, marketing efficiency, competitive intelligence, and churn and retention. All the good things. All the great things. The first two episodes, we talked specifically about win rate and sales enablement. We felt like this episode, we wanted to go a little more tactical. Bring in the big guns. Bring in the big guns. So today, we've got Jonathan Stevens, the VP of Consulting at Closed with us. Welcome, Jonathan. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We all call, we all call him Stevens around here, though. That's true. Yeah, we'll 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 go back and forth <laughs> as we do here. Yep. So today we brought Stevens on to lay out for us what we call the eight steps for a successful win loss analysis program. And and the goal here is anyone that's listening that's trying to figure out how do I start a win loss program or how do I improve one. We're going to walk through these eight steps to be a little more tactical, like I said, and actually help people implement a, a program. And and we'll go from there. Yeah, no, no dallying. We're going to hop right into the, into the good stuff here. So, Stevens, yeah, you, you kind of cultivated this list. This first one here, determine what you want to get out of your win-loss program. Break that down for us. What, what does that mean by that? Yeah, totally. I mean, it, it seems like it might be self-explanatory and, and maybe kind of obvious, but it's surprising how many people we talk to that start one of these programs and they don't really have a clear objective that they want to get out of, of the win-loss program. Right. Maybe vaguely they want to understand why they win and lose business. They might want to get a better understanding of their competitive landscape. But it, it's good to be a little bit more specific than that and really understand, okay, what, what are we trying to get out of this? Because if you start with a, with a vague mandate at the beginning, you're going to get vague results at the end. So, totally. so being really clear about what you're trying to achieve is, is pretty important. And ultimately, it also may sound obvious, but focus on trying to understand better why you are winning and losing business. And it's amazing to me how many win-loss programs I see either by other, other people that do this or, or people that have done this within their own organizations. And they get done and they're like, huh, we found out a lot of interesting information. We actually don't really know why we win and lose. <laughs> um, so, so it, again, it may seem obvious, but that's the that's the goal, and you should not lose sight of that goal as you go as you go through this. Do, do you feel like as as you as people start to, to collect this data, you're able to iterate and be like, hey, we want to understand why we win and lose, and that stuff comes like, oh, actually, we're starting to see a big gulf in our head-to-head -head deals. We want to understand why we're losing specifically to this customer. Like, do, do you feel like it's good to shift to a really specific priority or, or keep it vague at, or broad at first, I should say? Yeah, good question. I mean, it depends on your business. It depends on how many opportunities you have. If you're a high deal size, low pipeline volume type business, you really need to interview everybody or collect data somehow from, from everybody. But, but to your point, if, if you have a lot of opportunities going through the pipeline, it's good to start general and then start to really hone in on where your pain points are. You'll probably figure out pretty pretty quickly what what the trends are starting to emerge as, and then as you identify those trends, you can dig deeper into okay, well, it looks like we're losing a lot against this competitor. Well, let's just focus on that competitor for a while and understand what the what the issues are for that, um, or it might be a regional thing or a segment thing. Like I've 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 worked with businesses where they actually win a lot more deals that are bigger than $100,000 than smaller than $100,000, which is interesting. You know, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but for that, you'd want to focus on, well, what's, what's going on with these smaller and middle market type buyers that's different from the more enterprise type buyers. So, so yeah, I, I think to your point, you want to get more specific, but it depends on the nature of your business and your pipeline. Nice. So someone that's not doing win-loss and they can't iterate yet, how have they usually approached 
where they find this problem they're trying to figure out. Is this CRM? Is it, do they just come with you with ideas? Like, what do you usually see when you start a program? Yeah, yeah, good question. I mean, typically there is a pain point that, that somebody has identified, and most simply it's we're losing more deals than we think we should. Sometimes it's just that vague, right? They haven't done any other particular analysis. The next step is often people have consulted with, with their sellers and they find out some sort of high-level trend that they want to they wanna test, right? They have a hypothesis of what they think is going on. Um, but, but often, I think the most common way is people are mining some sort of data that they have internally, right? right. They get their CRM data and they're looking at some trends. And, and the interesting thing about CRM data is it really does a good job of telling you what's going on. It does a very poor job of telling you why that's going on. So that's where you need win-loss is to understand the why behind this, this trend that you're seeing. Gotcha. So when people get started, sometimes it's literally just an assumption, a business assumption about we're losing and we think it's pricing or we think it's just this segment we're going after. That's, yeah. that's what you're seeing. So you're saying people aren't coming to you fully prepared with like, we did a full CRM analysis over the last five years of every opportunity that came through and we have these four hypotheses. Like you're saying people start way sooner than that at just kind of the, the uh, assumption or guesswork stage. Yeah, that full CRM hypothesis or CRM analysis and hypothesis that is a result it's, it's rare. It's definitely an exception rather than the rule. Most of what we see when people first come to us is a lot of anecdotes. Gotcha. Is <clears throat> people haven't necessarily gone really deep, but they know that they're losing. They, they have some hunches, and they want us. They, I mean, that's the reason they come to us is they're trying to get something more rigorous and data-driven, and often they just don't have the time to do something like that. Sure. So that's great. That goes right into the next point of, okay, we've got these assumptions or this uh, this anecdotal evidence that we're losing for some reason more than we think we should. Um, and the next point that you've brought up is that the win-loss champion, is that we can call them that? They yeah. need to go get buy-in. And tell me more what you mean by buy-in. Buy-in from who? Buy-in to do what? Like, what, what are you hoping for there? Yeah, yeah, good question. So getting buy-in is really important. Sometimes that's easy, sometimes it's a lot harder. And I'll, I'll explain a couple of the ways that typically works. but. Typically, people that are thinking about win-loss, in, in our experience, often come from a competitive intelligence or product marketing function. Those, those functions need to get support from other functions within the organization to really make their win-loss program effective. And what I'll say is that the, the people that you want to know are the people that can actually affect change in your company. People that are building your product, people that are selling your product, they're the ones that matter. So in general, the, the one role that can be the make or break in, in one of these is like a, a head of sales, VP of sales type role. Hmm. They can be your biggest advocate. They can also be your biggest detractor. So if you don't have their buy-in, it's going to be really hard to get things done because ultimately you need to somehow collect data from the contacts that they have and if they're not allowing you to get those, you won't even be able to get off the ground. So yeah. getting buy-in right from the get-go is pretty important. I think the, the higher up in the organization you can go, the better. I've worked with companies where the CEO is literally ingesting every single piece of data that we're providing. That's obviously the best. It's not always possible, especially if you're in a huge company. So, But, but, I'm, but in general, the more cross-functional support you have, the better. And it doesn't always come right at the outset. So just because you don't have all of these people's buy-in at the beginning doesn't mean you can't get it. Sometimes it, it's, it's a little bit of a snowball effect where you tell them about it, they're like, they'll at least allow you to do it, but they're not really sold. And then you start to collect this win-loss data and show them the results, and then they start to be sold. So, so ideally you get it out of the gate, but sometimes it, it takes a little bit. I, I do think that, you know, coming from sales, I, I do think I see that a lot, especially with, with the, our sales reps. And it's it does seem like a, a, a sales director or leader could be a blocker. They're like, no, we're fine. We don't we don't we, we have a process. We know exactly what we're doing right and wrong. Um, I, I think there is a little bit of humility there because sometimes in sales and in marketing and product, there's a little bit of finger pointing. Oh, if only we had better leads, only if mm -hmm. we, the product team built this or whatever. I think what's great about a win-loss program, and, and you can expound on this 
is this idea of like, hey, you don't, it doesn't have to be like my opinion versus yours or my insights from the, from the seller's feedback versus what product thinks is more important or what some executive thinks. This is just data from the buyers, you know, that we've collected and said, hey, if we can all be open and honest about this, we can impact every department at a company if we're all bought in. Yeah, totally. Well, and that's why once you start collecting the data, it's really hard to refute the, yeah. the results. It's like, oh, wow, this is exactly what our buyer said. You know, 10, 10 of the people that we talked to out of the 20 that we talked to said, this particular feature in your product is totally useless and very difficult to understand. Yeah. Okay. I think we know what we need to do now. Yeah. Let's, let's double click on this a little bit more because I'm sure there's a lot of product marketers out there that are trying to figure this piece out. How do you buy it? Yeah. Because they're like, oh, I got to get a list of contacts. I, I need the permission to reach out to buyers, customers, and there's this roadblock of, well, who are you to talk to our customers? You're not in sales. Right. We don't want you to talk to them. It's, these relationships are critically important, which makes sense. Like We yeah. get that for Sa sure. Sales or, or customer. Yeah, the CSM side, the yeah. customer success side for sure. So um, I like what you said where it, you said um, as soon as the data starts to come in, it's really hard to refute it. It shows the value. So one thought I had is maybe product marketers should start, and I think a lot of them do, and they maybe don't get the best feedback, but they probably should start with like the low-hanging fruit, right? Like go after some wins and interview some customers that everybody is okay with you talking with and it's their people that like you. So I don't think you'll get as deep or as valuable insight where it's people that actually don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> but at least you can start to show a little, well, look, look at the quality of the interviews we're getting, look at the feedback we're getting, and hopefully in that you at least have some insights that sales wasn't aware of or or a customer success wasn't aware of, and then you can say, okay, I think there's something here. Let me go and interview these other people. Yeah. What do you think about something like that? Yeah, totally. I think that makes a ton of sense. I mean, <clears throat> if you if you start getting those those proof points, it makes it way easier. And and inevitably, what you alluded to, Trent, is that people will find out things that they didn't know. Yeah. And especially the people that go into this thinking, oh, I know why we win and lose. Right. Which. Sometimes they're sort of right, but almost always there's something that they didn't know that, that there's these aha moments that they have when they get this kind of feedback. And so, so I would say in general, you know, starting out with a couple of proof points usually is enough to, to at least get the ball rolling. So when it comes to, you know, get, getting these interviews, right, a, a lot of people are going into, you know, building this program for the first time. They don't really have a good grasp of how many people should I be reaching out to? What should I expect? as far as participation rates. One of the points that, that you said is essentially to be realistic about participation rates. What does that mean? Yeah, good, good question. So in general, before we start talking about participation rates, I'll just talk about the total number of data points you want to collect. In general, I think most people try to, they, they make these programs too small. They don't collect enough data to really get a representative sample of their whole business and their whole pipeline. Mm -hmm. That's not the case always, but, but I find that people generally err on that side. So you want to try to get more data. People tend to cherry pick their data too much, and they might find out information on particular deals, but it's not enough to really get defensible trends across their whole business. But that also leads into this participation rate situation. So what, what you'll find is, in general, not everybody will participate in a interview or fill out a survey to give you win-loss feedback. What we find generally is that for interviews, if, if they're incentivized, you're going to get about a 20% participation rate. So you have 500 opportunities going through your pipeline every year. You want to do 100 interviews or, or somewhere in that ballpark. That's, that's what we'd recommend. If you think you can get better participation, that's great. Let me know. Typically, that's, that's about the best we've seen in the business. And, and it depends on your types of buyers, too. We've found that certain business functions just have a greater propensity to talk to people and give mm -hmm. this kind of information. Others don't. So, so think carefully about your buyers and the type of, of propensity they're going to have to, to respond to something like this. I think that is one thing that we highlight, at least on the closed side of things, is everybody wants more participation rates, right? Like yeah. that's, we, we want more data. One nice thing about leveraging a third party is that one, it's a third party, right? As a buyer, having 
the person that you rejected come back and be like, wait, 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 let me, let me sweetheart deal you here. Like yeah. you're a little bit less inclined to kind of tell them the whole truth. Whereas a third party, again, if this is kind of why Yelp works as a platform, most people aren't giving that feedback directly to the restaurant owner. They're telling a third party, this was my experience. Um, so that's, that's one big advantage. And, and second is like you said, best in the business, we've been doing this for five, six years now. Uh, th that's part of what we invest in is the science behind what gets up participation rates. Like we invest in how do we increase that on the behalf of the programs that we run here? Can you, can you speak to any of that? Yeah, totally. Well, and this is, I would say the number one pain point of people that try to do this themselves without any sort of firm that's helping them is they come to us and they say, yeah, we had a really hard time getting people to participate. And then we ask them what they did and then we know why they had a hard time, right? <laughs> um, it's pretty clear. We've been honing this for years, and we have a team of a, a couple dozen people that all their job is is to get people to respond to things like this. Mm -hmm. There's email automation. There's cold calling. There's all sorts of things you can do. There's the cadences of the emails. There's the wording in the emails. We've all tested that. We've done all sorts of things to, to try to determine what's the what's the most effective way to get people to participate on this and so it helps to have that kind of person and to have that kind of machine running to help you get that Absolutely. that participation that you need let's talk a little bit more about when we see companies come to us and they say we've had a really hard time getting outreach to be effective and getting people to respond I would love to actually hear some of the things you've seen that do trip them up, and then people listening and be like, oh, yeah, that's, sending, that's totally what we're Sending like, brownies. That, you just got to send enough brownies. Yeah, exactly. That's probably effective, <laughs> but, but pretty expensive and pretty time-consuming. Right. Um, I guess if you have a really good brownie outsourcing tool, I don't know. But, but yeah, I mean, here's some of the things I've heard. Oh, yeah, we, we sent, we, we emailed everybody and nobody responded. It's like... Oh, how many emails did you send? Oh, one. Right. One off email. Yeah. Like, I mean, for everybody listening to this, how many emails do you respond to? And how many emails from somebody you are, have, that's tried to sell to you yeah. do you respond to the first time? So right. you have to send reminders. And, and sometimes people are so worried about that. People are used to it. If, you, if you're really overbearing in how you do it, that can be annoying and people mm -hmm. don't like it. But, but you have to send reminders. So that's something we've heard. I mean... The, another thing that we often hear is people don't offer any sort of incentive. Mm -hmm. There's, especially if you're in a business to business type setting, the person that's buying from you, they're not a poor person, right? If they have budget to buy software or to buy some sort of business to business service, right. they need some money to compensate them for their time or a reason to, right? Sometimes, sometimes people are motivated by a charity donation and they're a little bit more altruistic, but but there's got to be something that they're getting in exchange for giving you, you know, a half an hour of, your, of their time. So, so that's another key thing is, is people don't, don't offer any incentives. And the other thing is just that they're, they're starting from scratch and they don't have any experience doing it. Mm -hmm. So for people that are, they, they usually fumble around for a while till they see something that works. Whereas when we do it, we've been doing this for a long time. We know what works. We know it doesn't work. And so we don't have to waste that time. Yeah. And I love... Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that are in this path and they're ready to invest in a third party win loss solution like us, or they're trying to do it on their own, or they've got a program and they're somewhere in between, right? So let's, I, I want to just try to help the people that aren't ready to totally invest or they haven't gotten that buy in to buy a third yeah. party, right? So who, when you're thinking about that kind of person, like let's say I'm a product marketer and I'm trying to do win loss analysis and Scott's my sales champion over here, and you're, let's say, like my customer success champion, right? And I come to both of you and I'm like, hey, I need a list of contacts, and I'm gonna send an email out that says, hey, I'm from the marketing team with your win-loss expertise, and also in the CSM role, would you like, no, let's not do it that way, let's actually have the sales rep send it out, or let's have some other person, and their title just on this email is like, researcher or like customer advocate or something like that like how who should the emails come from how should they approach that should it be direct and it's like i'm on the marketing team i'd love to hear your experience or i'm on the sales team right yeah. i feel like if it came from the sales team the buyer would be like oh you're just trying to you're trying to win me back this exactly yeah. um and so what, what do you think there like how would you 
suggest to someone to do that effectively? Yeah, so, so typically what we do is when, when we do the initial outreach, we have it come from the highest level person that we can at the, the selling organization. Mm -hmm. So as Scott mentioned, like if the sales rep reach out, reaches out, they're going to be like, oh, well, is this really a postmortem? Are you just trying to sell me more? We're low on the totem pole. <laughs> but, if, but if they get an email from the CMO or the CEO, right. that's a little bit different. I think everybody knows that the C CMO isn't going to be the one actually talking to them, but maybe it has the CMO's buy-in, so they're going to give it a little bit more credence than, than something else. So, so that introductory email typically we, we send from the highest level person, and then some follow-up emails. I don't know if it matters as much who that comes from, mm -hmm. but having a title behind it actually does make a difference, and we've done research to show that that's true. That's awesome. So we kind of jumped right into your fourth point on top of the third of ensure effective outreach. And you talked about some incentives, um, be consistent. I think you talked about like, don't just send one and don't, don't be overbearing with it. Um, and let's dive into this, this other um, kind of sub bullet on ensure effective outreach where you talk about you need to focus on your most important feedback that you want to get back first. What I've seen a lot, I've seen this even in the PMA Slack channel when people ask about win-loss analysis, they'll say, well, surely you're sending a quantitative interview or a survey first and getting all that data. And then you're going out and trying to interview those positive and negative on the survey. So talk to me about what this point means in your, in your mind. Yeah. Good point. I mean, that is, that is a path that some people have chosen. We don't advocate for that. And Very I tell diplomatic. You, <laughs> <laughs> uh, without mentioning any names. So here's the thing. I mean, it, it actually, it, it's kind of, it seems intuitive at first, but mm -hmm. when you peel back the onion on that strategy, it, it doesn't work for a number of reasons. For one, there's a very like practical, logistical reason that it doesn't usually work. When you get, if you want to interview somebody and you believe that that's the holy grail of what you're trying to achieve ultimately, and you send them a survey first, they might fill out the survey and many of those don't go to the next step and do an interview, right? right? So, so you're going to start to get some fatigue in, in the people that you're trying to collect feedback from. And, and then you have to take two steps, which takes longer. And so that 20% response rate that we talked about, that goes down dramatically. Mm -hmm. What we've seen is for online surveys, typical response rates are about 3 to 5% 5, 5 when non-incentivized. They can get up to 10% when incentivized. But then if you layer on top of that an additional interview, you're looking at a 3 to 5% response rate and then maybe 20% of those. Right. Maybe you'll get better because they've actually responded to the survey first. But let's be really generous and say it's 40% of those. That's like 1 to 2%. Mm -hmm. right. so, so you're really, really narrowing down your pool when you do that. So that's just from a, a practical standpoint. The other thing is... It depends on the type of feedback you're trying to get. If I just sold something that was seven figures or greater and my main economic buyer was a CRO, it's kind of offensive to send them an <laughs> online survey. Like to be totally honest, like why would they've got a lot of things to do. Sure. Like you're going to talk to them and you're going to you're going to give them a decent incentive but, and not only that, not only is it offensive, but an online survey is not going to capture all of the nuance of a seven-figure deal. Mm -hmm. You really need to talk to them and get a few different perspectives. And you might want to talk to a few people at the organization, right? Yeah. You might want to talk to the head of IT or somebody in marketing or something like that because there might have been a few different perspectives on buying whatever this thing was that cost seven figures. So, so if you're talking about really big deals, don't send surveys. But on the other end of the spectrum, if you're talking about really small deals, and there's a lot of them, it just becomes impossible to interview everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've, we've got a client where a, a segment of their business sells deals that are less than $1,000 a year. We do a few interviews to capture some of the qualitative nuance, but we also survey a lot of them. I mean, we're talking about tens of thousands every month, right? That's just more interviews than anybody can do or really would want to do, right? But, but the surveys collect a really broad swath of feedback that people can see trends on clearly and and can come to some conclusions with so so it depends on the type of of business that you're dealing with and you know 
if, if you have somebody that's an expert at this, they can consult on what the best form of feedback is. But in general, people are only gonna respond to one type of feedback. So you want to get the type of feedback that's best suited for the type of sales cycle that they were in. Yeah. One thing you mentioned earlier too is the, the, the majority of the time when people come to us, they don't really have the best sense of why they're winning and losing. That's why they're building the program, right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't really know why you're winning and losing, that's maybe not the best starting point on a survey to be mm -hmm. like, it could that's be anything, right? We don't, we don't really know. If you can start with, you know, qualitative surveys and start to get, oh, these are, this is what people are saying. Maybe these are the reasons. And then use that information to guide a survey after the fact. I would imagine a much better outcome. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, if you if you really don't know what to ask, then you're gonna have a whole bunch of other please specify type type answers right. in your survey. Whereas if you do a few interviews first, you can get a better sense of the type of responses that you're likely to get, and then you can understand the magnitude of those responses once you do a survey. So that's a really good point, Scott. Yeah, it is. Yeah, because I can imagine if you had a survey that's like on a scale of one to ten, help me understand pricing. Like, and then like one, and you're like, please tell me more. And you say that, please tell me more. Please tell me more. After every it's single like, uh, one, I, did, I bet your response rate's gonna tank. Yeah, yeah. It'd be so Nobody's low. gonna finish the survey. Yeah, exactly. That's that's a great point. Awesome. Um, so let's dive into. Um, you talked a little bit about interviews. Let's dive into the actual interview when you finally get somebody to say yes and you've got the interview scheduled, let's dive into that a little bit and some of your best practices there. Yeah, yeah, so so our approach is really to make the interviews adaptive. And what we mean by that is, look, you can hire somebody with a pretty, pretty basic level of understanding of your business, pretty basic level of education to just read you question after question. Mm -hmm. But the goal of this is to understand why you win and lose and to get deep insights. And in, in order to do that, you need an adaptive interview. What we mean by that is you start the interview general and then you ask a few questions to, to try to figure out the, the things that you really want to drill in on. And then you take the most time on the things that were most relevant to, de to the decision that was made. So, for example, if I was asking somebody about purchasing a piece of software and they said, yeah, you know, it was just too expensive. And then I move on and say, okay, well, tell me about this feature and that feature. That's a non-adaptive way of doing that. I want to know, well, what do you mean when you say it was too expensive? Oh, we didn't have the budget. Oh, well, if you did have the budget, would you have bought this? Oh yeah, totally. I think it's awesome. It's just way too feature rich and way too expensive for what we need. Okay. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's a really short line of questioning, but it gives you a sense of, if you drill down, you have a better understanding. In that case, the person wasn't worried about the value. They just didn't have the budget. They would have mm -hmm. loved the Ferrari, but they had a Honda Civic type, type budget. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why adaptive interviews are so important. We really discourage just that question after question you know, in a predetermined type of format yeah. approach because you miss, you miss a lot of that nuance. Some people, and I know this is controversial, so I'm just going to address it right now. Some people that have a really formal marketing research perspective will say, well, don't you need to ask the same questions in the mm -hmm. same order every time right. so you can make your results most comparable? Yes, there is some value to that, but we feel that the value you get out of really drilling in on the things that are most important far outweighs just having a really comparable set of data across all of your interviews. I, I think this is, really, this is something that... that uh, that we teach to our sales reps, which is, pe you know, this this concept of buyers or liars, right? That people will say things, and, and we mentioned this on a, on an earlier episode, where the reason that we stopped talking with a, 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 per a prospective vendor, the reason that we told them was like, yeah, we just don't really have budget for it, and then offline, what we started talking about was like, well, it's it's that plus all this other stuff, right? And, and once you get to the root of an issue, right? If, if, if you say, well, was it too expensive? Well, no, it wasn't too expensive. I just didn't really believe in it. And it's like, well, how, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I've, I've used these other things. And ultimately, like, I just don't have, I have no faith in this technology at all. Got it. Is there anything that could change your mind on that? No. <laughs> okay. So, so the, the problem there, if you were to just rely on the CRM data, it would say, close off reason the sales would put price, which is wrong. And then if you, if you took it at the survey level, I would say price for, you know, and features 
three, mm-hmm. right? And you say, well, it seems like it's both. It's like, well, no, like it's it really is one root big issue. That's the real reason that we said no. If that's not there, that changes the whole buying cycle, right? So I think it's, yeah, I think this idea of adaptive interviewing is super important because you're getting to the root issue. I I, I would argue is a lot more valuable than saying like, oh, well, generally people have like a, a wide you know, disdain for, you know, too, too much implementation fees. Mm-hmm. It's like, yes, is that really the reason they're buying or not buying? Is that the reason? Yeah, totally, totally. And, and I mean, a lot of the time we, we, when we're talking to, to prospects, they say, oh, we want a consultant that really has expertise in our industry. And I think that may be important, but what, what people don't at least initially see enough value in is that interview skill set because to be able to conduct an interview while you're drilling down and finding out the root cause of the issue that's a skill and a lot of people don't have that immediately and and when you have people that do it full time then then you know that they're they're skilled in the the ability to understand an issue and to drill down to get at the heart of the issue to to do exactly what scott was talking about right because if you don't know what the true reason was then you can't react to it and adapt your business accordingly. So that's something that we're really big on. And it, it's, it's really pr- pretty satisfying when you ask somebody a question, you get a surface level answer, and then tactfully drill down a little bit and you realize, whoa, there's way more to it than just, oh, we got, we got acquired. Hmm. Well, it's like, well, did you have budget? Well, yeah, the acquiring company actually increased the size of our budget. Well, what happened, you know? <laughs> A lot of people just assume that that first answer is is all they need, but you really need a lot more depth to understand the full full measure of the situation. Win loss therapy. Is really know, that's right. Now that's I'm right. <laughs> Anytime I talk to Stevens, I'm like, is he drilling deeper? I know. It's, it's uncomfortable, like your, isn't it? Why didn't you like your lunch trip? <laughs> yeah, Tell me exactly. about it. Um, I was. This is exactly where my mind went when you were saying this, Stevens. Is I've been in the shoes of somebody who is out there trying to interview customers and understand why they won and lost, right? And in my mind, my first my f- first intuition told me, okay, you need to go ask the same exact question every time so that you have comparable data sets at the end. And I had deep experience in the industry and in the product and the competitors and the customers and everything, right? And I set out to do these interviews and I think I did for the last company I was at, I, I probably did 20, like in a good amount of time, both won and lost deals, right? Asked the same questions. I knew the industry really well. And at the end of the day, when I looked at all these 20 interviews, it goes back to your first point. I sat there and I was like, I still don't know why we went or lose. <laughs> <laughs> like I asked, huh. but I did that. I asked exactly the questions, but I didn't have, first off, I didn't have the skill set to know which questions to ask. And then I also, I definitely didn't have the interviewing skill set, nor the methodology of going into it open-minded and, and doing adaptive interviews, right? It was like, all right, these are my fixed questions and I don't know how to like, you know, move or pivot if I need to and dive deeper on specifics. And I think it showed at the end of that, that was like a six month thing. And at the end I was like, I got some stuff, but I really don't know for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. it's not as easy as, as people initially think it would be. Yeah, and I think a lot of people's minds um, would probably go to, well, I don't want to hire a third party because there's no way they'll ever know the industry as well as me. Um, so, and it sounds like where you're coming from on that is, yeah, that's great. That's very valuable that you have that industry experience, but what you don't have is the interviewing experience. And I think our every consultant I've met that works here is savvy enough to pick up on that but i don't know that every product marketer i've met is is has the time to really invest into figuring out how to interview right yeah um and that that's kind of the trade-off i think people need to make yeah and the reality is if you if you hire a third party to do something like this they're not going to know your industry as well as you do yeah. i mean if you've been working in your industry for 20 years right they're not going to spend 20 years researching and understanding the industry before <laughs> they start your win-loss project right but all of these other skills are arguably what's more important they, they can get familiar enough with the industry to to do an effective win-loss program but the other things that, that a third party can provide and a really good interviewer can provide are are what you really need out of that third party. Yeah, awesome. So we've, we've talked a lot about, you know, getting by and getting, you know, make sure you get outreach. You've got them on the phone. 
you're doing adaptive interviews now, you're listening to all these great points, you're, you're adjusting on the fly. Um, it sounds like a common mistake that people make is that they don't capture the interview. One of the points you have here is, is to record the interview. Talk to us about why that's important. Yeah, it might seem kind of obvious. One of the, one of the clients that came to us after doing a DIY win-loss program, their program consisted of making, using the Notes app on their iPhone mm -hmm. to, to record what they found. And I was like, well, how did you share that with executives? <laughs> like, I don't know if your credibility was all that high with, with, that, kind of, with that kind of recording. We, we record the interviews, right? And, and the first thing we always hear, well, aren't people uncomfortable being recorded? Well, here's the thing. We, we only share it with, with our clients. Those things aren't publicly available. And the other thing is there's no way you can type or write notes fast enough to really capture everything that's going on. So it might seem obvious, record the interview. If people, people, the thing people are worried about with that is just how widely it's going to be shared. So if they're confident that it's only going to be used by internal sources to make business decisions, then they're typically okay with that recording. Awesome. And then your next point on this list, Stevens, is identify key trends, which I'm kind of biting at the bit thinking about when, like I said, my first intuition when I did this was you've got to have every single question the exact same so you can compare data and find those trends and insights, right? So how do you do that if you're doing adaptive interviews and, and tell me some of the best practices there? Yeah, so, so the, way, the way we typically do it with is, is with a concept called decision drivers. So we'll come up with categories and subcategories of feedback and basically at the end of each interview, identify what were the main things that drove the outcomes of this decision and we we make notes and then we identify the quotes from our recorded interview that support those decision drivers. So an example might be sales process and follow-up. That's, that's a category that you can use. And if, if the buyer said something like, this salesperson was so hard to get a hold of, they never followed up, so we just kind of gave up and didn't, didn't want to buy it, even though we liked the product. That would be an example where you'd tag sales process and follow-up and the decision driver would be negative. So that's with one particular piece of data. And then if you do several interviews or several surveys and you have those decision drivers aggregated over time, then you can start to see trends. So if you have, let's say you do 20 interviews and in eight of them, sales process and follow up was a negative issue, then if I was a CRO, I'd be panicking if that was the case. <laughs> but, but what that indicates is that people either aren't following up or they're way too aggressive, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're not, ensuring the right amount of follow-up in the sales process. So that's how you can take something from one data point to a trend that you can actually see over a collection of data points. And that's, that's really what you want to do and that what you want to be the outcome of this. Because ultimately, if you, let's say we, we have this example again, 20 interviews, there's probably gonna be three to five things that really surface as the most important trends. But if you just have a whole bunch of text and you don't have a way of capturing those key trends, you're not gonna know what those things are. And you might, you know, let's say somebody was really outspoken in one of the interviews and you really latch onto one of the quotes, people are gonna maybe chase that, whether where that was just a one-off kind of edge case type issue. What you want is you wanna understand what's going on across the entire pipeline so you can address the bigger issues that are common across many buyers. Yeah, that's awesome. I actually love the, the, the term you coined earlier called, where you said defensible trends. I actually really like that as a term where it's like, hey, you're not just looking for trends, you're looking for defensible tr things you can say like, mm -hmm. here's a process that we need to change and here's why. The data is suggesting this. This isn't my opinion, this is what the data is telling us, right? And you want, you want to build your program to identify those kinds of trends that you can not only diagnose, but then also work to provide solutions for. Right? Yeah, and, and the defensible part of that really comes from you have to identify something that the prospective buyer said that indicates that that was the real reason they made a decision, right? Anybody can have a conversation and say, oh, well, I think this was the reason that they made this decision. Well, what did they actually say that indicates that was the case? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's where it becomes defensible. If I, if I find that situation where eight times out of 20 sales process and follow-up was an issue and I have quotes from buyers that support that, 
it's really hard to refute that. Mm -hmm. And so these decision drivers that you're using to find key trends and insights and to categorize uh, feedback you're getting, do you, t do you determine these like before you go do the interviews and you have a list of them, uh, I assume, right? And how would, you, how would you coach somebody? Like what would you tell them some of the decision drivers should be initially if someone's doing DIY win loss right now? Yeah, definitely. Typically we start with a set of decision drivers that are common for, for a B2B sales type scenario. If you're dealing with a different kind of business, like one client that we worked with recently, they're basically a, a wealth management solution. It's much more services heavy than product heavy, so the decision drivers are going to be different than somebody that sells, I don't know, customer support software or sure. something like that, right? So you, you usually come in with a hypothesis, but then you adapt and you build your decision drivers as you collect your information. If I were to advise somebody, to, to the next part of your question, if I were to advise somebody that's just starting one of these, what the decision drivers would be, typically they come in a few categories. They are product or service, depends on your type of business. Is it more product heavy or service heavy? For closed, we actually have both because there's a service element to what we do and a product element. Mm -hmm. So product or service and sales process, that's always part of it. Sometimes there's a marketing element. There's always a pricing category and often there's a competitor category. Sometimes those competitor pieces of information get captured in the others, but you want to have specific competitor type things. Um, there, there may be others, depending on your business, you might have a more, like a customer support section with, with drivers that are related to that. But, but I would say typically your drivers will bundle up into those general categories. Right, and then as things pop up more, maybe you add another like sub decision driver type thing you could dive deeper in is, is what, you, what you would coach people. Yeah, totally, totally. It depends on how much feedback you're getting, but like commonly for, for sales, like if sales was your category, mm -hmm. that sales process and follow-up is one. Sales empathy and communication is another one. So that's a subcategory. That has to do more with, do the people actually listen to you? Are they good communicators? Um, sales trust and professionalism is another one. Mm -hmm. Like, did you feel like they were credible? Did they? And then sales knowledge and expertise is another one. Did you feel like they knew what they were talking about? Those are different aspects of a sales experience that certain things people will say fall into one of those categories depending on you know what what yeah. the decision was no, not to plug closed once again but <laughs> but i'm gonna but do I'm it gonna do it. <laughs> he's gonna do it i, I got sales in my veins uh, <laughs> one advantage again of using a third party is that they they've done this before with lots of other clients and so if you're kind of looking at this like i don't really know where to start i, I i'm not sure which decision drivers make the most sense right having uh, a, a weathered hand to be like, well, this is what we've seen in other industries that, that you're in. Um, here's where we can start. And as a program rolls out, the, the way our programs are structured are kind of on a quarterly basis, typically. And so every quarter, you're able to kind of analyze the data and have somebody give recommendations and give guidance and give feedback and show results and, and uh, display that information in a really friendly way for, again, somebody who maybe is just getting into this, right? So that's a really huge upside to product marketer or somebody who like, this is this is their thing that they're having to steer head. If they're going into it completely blind, it can be kind of a dark and dreary world, right? Where it's, it's we're saying, hey, like we'll do literally most of the heavy lifting for you right. and then present to you on a silver platter and then you're the hero and you're inside your org, right? Yeah, totally, totally. And I mean, I think that's that's really what puts the icing on the cake with this whole thing. If you collect all this information, but you don't get it to the people that can make decisions and affect change within your business, it's a really big waste of time. So you need to make sure that the way you're sharing the findings is effective. And one of the pitfalls that I've seen when people get to this point is they keep the, the data too close and they don't share it. And I think the, the reason people are doing that is they're thinking, oh, people need to know that I did this. So, so they don't want to share it too broadly because then the ownership and the credit gets gets right. diluted. But here's the reality. The more people that know about this, the more people will be able to affect change as a result, right? right? You don't have to come up with recommendations. A really good win-loss program will diagnose the challenges and the, the strong points of your business well enough that there's a whole host of people 
that can go figure out really intelligent solutions based on the context of what they're doing in their job function. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily need to do that for them. Just getting the findings and just diagnosing the issues will make you look like a hero. And quarterbacking it, right? Yeah. Being the, being the driving force to be like, hey, here's feed, there's more feedback coming in. We need solutions for these things. And yeah. like being that driving force is so important in a business. It, it often just gets left by, the, left by the wayside without someone doing it and having doing it in an effective way. Yeah. Yeah, I think I talked about that in an earlier episode where if you're a product marketer and you're doing win loss and you get all of this insight and you see sales has a problem, product has this problem, marketing has this problem, customer success, pricing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you're sitting there and you can actually go solve all of those problems, you shouldn't be a product marketer. <laughs> you should be yeah, the CEO. a founder, a CEO of a huge company. It's like, you know what I mean? Yeah. You should be driving a billion dollars something or other. And so um, I think that's superhuman. I think it's too unrealistic to expect a product marketer to find all of these insights. First, that's just really hard to do in the first place. And then after you see the insights or the data come back, I think it's too much to assume one product marketer or anybody in the team could go solve all the company problems, right? So I love that idea of sharing the insights. We actually had a customer from Lupio um, named Caleb Lau, who's a product marketer there. And I just want to read this quote from him. He said, um, the win-loss program would be a failure if us as product marketers, if we got smarter, if we got enriched with all these insights and everybody else was kind of left out, that would be a failure. That was like one of his key metrics to success is how many people are going to actually get the insights and how many people are going to share it with. And they eventually shared it with like the entire company. Right. Um, and that's, I think, the companies that have the most success with this are doing it that way. So, so let's recap these eight points for the listeners who have lost track. Let's see if you can keep track. Let's see if you can okay. get them. So number one, determine what you want to get out of your win-less program. Number two, get buy-in for that program. Number three, be realistic about those, participa those participation rates for the program. As you, as you start reaching out, uh, number four, ensure you have effective outreach. So it's not just one email. Number five, ensure as you start having those interviews, those interviews are adaptive. They're not just generic questions that aren't, you know, probing, right? You want good adaptive interviews. Number six, make sure you record it so you can double back and, and get notes and make sure you're getting all the data. Uh, number seven, you want to identify key trends, uh, defensible data, right? And then, and then finally share your findings. If, you, if, you, if you've done all this great work and you don't share it, it's, it's almost all for naught, right? We argue here at Close, that's one of the big benefits of us. You mentioned services and a product. The product that we offer is both our consultants and their great expertise, but also this really great platform that everybody gets access to where you can see the customer quotes, you can see how you stack up against your competitors, why you're winning, why you're losing against specific competitors. And we try and serve that data up for you in a really easy to, to consume way so that again, everybody can see it and then they can start to make change, to make business change. Because that's, that's the end goal, right? If you, if you find out why you win and lose and you don't do anything about it, Again, it's, it's for not, right? Yeah, waste yeah, of time. Exactly. So anyone listening that wants to dive deeper on any of these topics Stevens has talked about, we wrote the definitive guide to win-loss analysis. And you can go download that at winlossexperts.com. Stevens, thanks for your time. This was a great episode. Thank you, gentlemen.